So, welcome to another Junior Developer Happy Hour. Woo! <laughs> pipe, pipe, pipe. <laughs> um, we are, we've been doing this for, well, a, a similar version of this for about three months-ish, probably. And we are trying to just help everybody who is getting into the job market, whether that be switching careers or first time in the job market after as they're graduating from school or something. Um, this week is a little bit different because typically we've been inviting a bunch of, um, we've typically been inviting special guests each week and just getting their perspective on any of the questions that you have. Yeah, where's the air horn? Come on. <laughs> um, but this week, we are going to just be talking a lot about imposter syndrome because I happen to believe that it is intertwined with becoming an, a junior developer. Um, really, I think anytime a person is learning something new is when some sort of like self-doubt might creep in. And boy, is this a new skill for a bunch of people and a new way of thinking. So um, I think... We have, yeah, we've posted the Slido in the Jitsi chat. That's a great place for anybody in case you're new. That's the great place to post your questions. They can get upvoted so we can make sure to talk about the most relevant questions for everybody. Um, earlier I looked and there were no questions yet, but now there are, cool. So um, then if there are follow-up questions, that's uh great time to put the question in the actual Jitsi chat right here. So also if we talk about any sort of resources that might be helpful, those can go in the Jitsi chat here. Um, I think that's maybe all about what I wanted to say about today. Um, and then I can also just give you a background again about me and maybe give you a different angle of my background. Um, so I did go to a boot camp in 2017. I went to Dev Boot Camp before it closed down. And I have been working as a software engineer since then at Trunk Club. We recently got fully absorbed by Nordstrom. So now we are called Nordstrom Trunk Club. Um, and that evolution has been continuing from day to day. Um, in Let's see, September of last year, I gave a talk on imposter syndrome at uh, JS Camp Chicago um, because I had this opportunity to give a talk at the at the at my first tech like conference and that was something that I mean I have a lot of experience in because I had crazy, crazy imposter syndrome. Um, and I spent a lot of time working through that imposter syndrome. And then since giving that talk, I have started working with somebody um, as, I mean, I had been working with a coach to help me through my imposter syndrome. And now I am actually coaching people. I have become certified in, um, I'm a certified confidence coach. So I've spent some time learning about like, how our brains react under stress and how we can try to help our brains get through that a little bit better than what would otherwise happen if we just like shove everything under the rug and forget about it. Um, so I think that is maybe all I'm gonna say about that for now. Um, Sam, why don't you, Give your intro. Yeah, I'll just do a really quick intro so we can get started with the questions. Um, I'm a front end engineer at Lyft currently. Uh, I build internal tools, uh, web, only web. Um, our stack is React, TypeScript, Node.js, TechGeo, which is a Uber open source library. <laughs> um, we use a lot of Uber <laughs> open source libraries. Um, that's fun. They make they make good stuff, um, <laughs> <laughs> and they open source all of it too, which is awesome. 
Um, what else? Uh, I have a weird journey how I became a software engineer, a very long, windy path. I graduated during the dot com bus with a um, degree in computer science. Never ended up getting a job. I gave up too quickly. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so I just quit and just got any job I could get, which was at Kinkles, which is uh, FedEx office now, worst job on the planet. Um, but uh, and then I ended up working in the mortgage industry somehow. And that was terrible. And that blew up in 2008. And then I joined the Peace Corps and left America for three years. I went and lived in West Africa for three years, Togo for two years, and Burkina Faso for a year. Um, then when I came back, I went to Dev Bootcamp. And that was the beginning of my software engineering career. I actually made it into the industry this time. I had a solid network to like help me like get into the industry that second time around. Um, and I did a bunch of stuff from contract work to working at a big company with like 10,000 people to small startup to helping my friends try to start a startup. And now I work at Lyft. So yeah, that's my condensed version of my journey, <laughs> which is a really long journey. But yeah, looks like the questions are rolling in, Brady. Totally Let's rolling get... in, yeah. Um, yeah, so we can get started with that. Um, I keep looking at the camera and like gesturing as if you could see me. I keep forgetting it's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll come back. But you look great, Brady. You look great. <laughs> I appreciate that. I love your hair today. Oh, thanks, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's shaped like a bee. <laughs> it took me a long time to get it just like that. <laughs> All right. Um, so this first one, I love this question so much. Just got my first offer for a dev role and immediately went from frustrated with interviewing to terrified I will fail, won't be able to produce. Is this normal? I would say 100% normal. Yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I used to agree like i i was i was worried when i was in dev boot camp when i was going through the um the whole program that maybe i wasn't up to par with the other people that i was working with and that's what i had considered at that point like oh yeah i've got imposter syndrome maybe i'm not good enough and then i got my job and it kind of hit me out of nowhere it didn't it didn't hit me until <sighs> I was I was really really grateful that my team was um, they seemed to have a very fair like expectation of me and they just wanted me to like watch people do what they were doing for the first three weeks or so and so it wasn't until maybe the second month or like a month and a half in that I was like, wait, but I'm not making my own PRs yet. And um, that's when I started getting that terror <laughs> that I wasn't good enough. And that because I was not making my own PRs and not able to work on my own, that maybe I was failing. Um, yeah, I think the more I've talked to people, the more I do realize that it's not until you're actually in the situation where you're, you're like, people are expecting me to do something and I'm actually getting money for it that it sets in even stronger. I saw Sam nodding his head. Do you have anything? Yeah, no, I'm, I think even if you've been in the industry for a while, every new company you go to, <laughs> you experience this, I think, because most companies, it takes a while to onboard with the company. So then you feel like you're learning too slow or like you're overpaid because <laughs> these companies pay you a lot of money a lot of the times, especially in the Bay Area. So like, especially if the company's paying you a lot of money, you're just like, uh, they're like wasting money on me. <laughs> um, but like yeah, you just, you just gotta, um, 
try and not think about it and just concentrate on just just doing what you can and if you just keep getting better a little bit every day that that's good that's providing value for the company i think um yeah totally um yeah i think that's all i have to say on that one um this next question is besides cold emailing people on LinkedIn or Twitter, are there any other methods I could take to network virtually? Um, yeah. So I love, we've talked a, a lot about like meetups, um, stuff like this, I think is really great stuff like, um, like, ha uh, Code for America, where a bunch of people are getting together to actually code on a project. Uh, you, you'll likely meet a bunch of people that are also working on the project there. Um, and then you can always start your own group, either start your own or find a group that maybe is helping prepare for interviews or something. I know somebody who had organized a weekly like interview prep group and so from what i understood they would get together on a certain evening every single night it was mostly people from her boot camp but i know that that group kind of grew with time um and they would just get together and practice like uh algorithm problems or something um that's what comes to mind first sam do you have other other ideas um, is what is this question the, the networking one? Yeah. Uh, I highly recommend learning in public. Um, that is a way to network because <laughs> if you consistently are learning in public, um, people are going to interact with your like social media posts or whatever. Um, then you they start following you and then you might start following them and then it just it builds up a network um, just by learning in public. So. That's like I always say, the 100 days of code, that's a huge community. That is a network. <laughs> that's a network of a whole bunch of people trying to learn how to code or just get better at coding. Like I'm doing it. Um, and I learn new stuff every day. <laughs> and I don't know if I would be doing that um, if I didn't commit to doing the 100 days of code. Like I've done it for 20 days now. Um, and yeah. It, my my network actually grew a lot in those 20 days. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I do a lot of other stuff. So everything just combines, I think, together from like, you can start your own meetup like we did. Um, I formed study groups. I took a Udacity Nano degree once. And I talked about this before. I took the self-driving car Nano degree. I never did finish it, but um, it was too time consuming to do that in addition to working full time. Um, but I met a lot of awesome people. I formed a study group like um, Drone Deploy actually let us use their office on Saturdays for the study group for a while, which was really awesome. Um, one of the people in the study group um, worked there and convinced them <laughs> to let us go there and like eat all the stuff in their kitchen and use their like whiteboards and hang out in their office. So that was really awesome. I started at a workshop cafe, which used to be an awesome cafe in San Francisco where you, it was like a co-working space slash coffee shop um, where like you didn't have, like you paid to sit down at these tables. They had monitors at some of the tables. It was like two, three bucks an hour, but you weren't forced to like buy coffee. So you could just uh, pay hourly like a co-working space and then use it but if you want coffee like you would just like push buttons and people would come bring it to you while you're working so you didn't even need to stand up um and that place got pretty popular so i started the study group there and then it we had a solid like at least 10 people that would come like every week and so yeah you can just start up any kind of stuff like that you can start up discussion boards um yeah, I don't know. Just make an open source project, like some kind of fun thing. You can create games. I don't know. You can just try all kinds of stuff and just see like what works. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and when you mentioned the learning in public thing, we've got a guest coming up September 5th, Martha Sharp. Um, she's all over my LinkedIn, or she was even before I connected with her. And she, I think a year ago only, decided to just teach herself how to code. And she did it all in public and would make videos of her working on code. And she just got offered a full-time job a couple of weeks ago. Um, and clearly, if she has reached my LinkedIn and like judging by all of the connections she has that just really helped her with the networking. Um, yeah, it was, it's impressive. Do you have, um, Brady, do you have any suggestions? Cause like uh, um, regarding imposter syndrome and learning in public, because mm. if you have imposter syndrome, <laughs> you might be like afraid to like learn in public. So uh, yeah. maybe, you have, maybe you have tips on like, how to well, overcome that and just be like, screw it. Yeah. I'm just going to be like Gary Vee and not care what anybody <laughs> says. Just, just post it and not be afraid to look dumb. I think, um, yeah, there's, so the thing that is unfortunately hard to really like internalize is, so there's imposter syndrome where you legitimately believe that you're not like there's I feel like you could kind of make this differentiation between confidence and imposter syndrome um, for me like I had both I had a lack of confidence and I had this feeling that no 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 really I don't know enough to be working with my coworkers. like I don't think that I'm learning and I am afraid that I will therefore get fired um, I think posting things if you are a junior developer is maybe more towards the needing confidence side um, and and you can do things to i feel like if you are going to post something in public you don't have to necessarily show yourself struggling how to get through this algorithm challenge or something you can post things that you feel proud of you could potentially if you are feeling uh, if you're feeling like you don't want to put your work out in public you could always talk to somebody that has a little bit more experience and be like hey do you see anything that i that you think i should improve um and that would be a little bit more in in private and then after you get some feedback then maybe you feel a little bit more comfortable posting in public um but i think mostly just remembering that everybody has to start somewhere <laughs> everybody has to start like not knowing how to iterate through an array or um I imagine most of the people listening right now know how to do that. So maybe looking at, I, I found some groups on Facebook where there are true beginners and you can, people ask questions that, yeah, they would have stumped me years ago. I didn't understand um, some guy, I think I posted in our Slack channel actually, somebody a while back, was he just couldn't comprehend why do you need something like console.log in javascript um and if anybody has worked on a project in javascript here i mean it's just debugging <laughs> you know you you frequently get something happening that you're you're not understanding um, the best debugging tool <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, it saves me every day. <laughs> um, so remembering that if you are lacking this confidence to to post your work and, and like learn in public, it probably means that you are comparing yourself to people who've got a lot more experience than you. But you could also kind of try to balance that out by helping people who have less experience than you. Um, and you can work through this, like, 
comparison. I, I try to tell people not to compare yourself to other people. It's really, it's so much easier said than done. Um, but really that is what needs to stop happening. I think if, if you're worried about learning in public and, and posting your work in social media, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I'd also recommend, I don't know if it'll work for everybody because, um, but I also recommend just watching Gary V videos. <laughs> <laughs> it might just be me. Um, but yeah, it makes, it, it, gives, it pumps me up. Um, Same. It's, it's like, no. it's, it's, uh, people either hate him or love him. <laughs> I don't know if there's an in-between for Gary V. Um, but uh, yeah, he's always like, yeah, screw what people think. Like, just, just do you. <laughs> um, but I if would, you can, what is that? Oh, uh, I was kind of on the fence about him. It's funny that you said people aren't. <laughs> I think because I didn't like him. <laughs> and I heard so many other people saying that they love him so much. And I was talking <laughs> to a friend and she was pointing out, yeah, he can he can come off strong and, and be like, screw what other people think. But it all comes from a place, she pointed out, like he is just, he's got so much self-compassion and is so comfortable in himself. And that's what really resonates with her. That's why she loves him so much because yeah. she aspires to have that sort of like self-compassion too. Yeah. Um, I don't actually watch the Tea Time with Gary Vee. I watch the, the clips <laughs> on, on Instagram. I follow him on Instagram and I watch his clips and I like almost all of them. <laughs> I heart all, almost all the content he puts out. Um, but yeah, if you can figure out how to overcome that and learn in public and try and just post and don't pay attention to it, the engagement, like if nobody's liking it, who cares? If there's trolls coming in the comments, just block them <laughs> or, or mute them or do something um and just focus on learning in public those people who all the people that i see who do it they learn really fast like the people who aren't afraid to look dumb those are the people that learn the fastest um like that that's kind of just what i noticed um not even just with social media even like when i did peace corps i had to learn french because uh, I lived in a French speaking company, um, country. Uh, and my the volunteer that was in my French class, we were like in the lowest one because we didn't have any, we didn't know how to speak French at all. And they make you take French class all day for like the first two, three months for like, not all day, but like you have like four hours of French language class. And you also live with a local family who's only speaking like French and local language. Um, and the volunteer that was with me learned way faster than me because she just would ask a million questions and wasn't just didn't care about asking like stupid questions and i think i was more hesitant so i learned slower mm -hmm. um but yeah so now I, I i think about that a lot now though when i'm like learning stuff just just ask the questions even in a class setting like there's probably a, tons of other people who have the same question. I notice a lot of junior developers, they'll like, instead of like asking questions, like like I started doing PRs on like this evolution app I made and people will be like DMing me questions about things I posted in the PR. And I had to like recommend that you gotta ask the questions on the PR. Um, <laughs> because then anybody can see the same question. Other people probably have the same questions. So you're like helping other people <laughs> out as well. So even, um, yeah, even at work, I like always like recommend that people ask in the public Slack channels like questions and let's just like, if it's like a technical question, ask in the public channel, there's like tons of people there is more chance you'll get different like um, people that will help out rather than just getting one person's opinion by like DMing them. Then the information becomes siloed between just you and that person rather than sharing that information with everybody. 
Yeah, I think um, it's worth noting, like, it's uncomfortable to learn. <laughs> it's uncomfortable to grow in general. Like, if you've ever gone to the gym and lifted weights, your muscles are sore. Like, it's in any way that you are ever going to grow as a human, it's not comfortable. Um, and getting gaining confidence is is the same. And you kind of have to just like sit with that sometimes and be like, this is going to make me feel stupid to ask this question. But the more you're able to ask questions, even if you feel like that maybe they're stupid, the more that you are able to put yourself out there, <laughs> wherever there is, um, the more you're going to be able to do it and the, the less uncomfortable it will feel. Um, cool. I feel like we can move on yep. to, have you ever seen a person fired because they indeed did not know what they were doing? Um, not that I can think of, but my memory kind of sucks. So <laughs> I know, um, there was a person, I mean, I've, I, I witnessed a person get fired from my company, but I, I don't think it was because they didn't know what they were doing. I think they were able to perform and there were other things getting in the way of them from like showing up to work and working on tickets. And um, that was kind of triggering for me, not having understood the full scenario. I was worried that maybe that would mean that I could get fired for not performing. However, I had to keep reminding myself that we have a policy, at least at my company, that, I mean, your manager has to talk to you and let you know if you're underperforming. If, if somebody is going to just fire you out of nowhere for not knowing what you're doing, that's, I would rather you not be working in that company. That doesn't, it sounds like a toxic environment. Yeah. Um, so um, I've not heard of that happening at my company. I've, I've, uh, I've not asked around for people for my, I've not asked my network to see if other people have uh, seen that happen, but I feel like maybe it would have come up in conversation. <laughs> I. I don't know of a scenario where that's been the case. Yeah, me neither. And yeah, I think most companies, at least companies that have been around, they usually, you, like Brady said, your manager will have one-on-ones -on -ones with you and like help help you <laughs> um, figure out if there's areas you need to improve on so you know what to work on. Um, if a smaller startup, they might not have those kind of processes in place yet, but you can put those processes in place. You can recommend that you can set up the one-on-ones with your manager, or if there is no manager, it's still small with the founders or whoever's at that company. Like just because processes don't exist, um, you can uh, you can be the one to create them. Um, totally. So, um, yeah. and then I think it's also worth remembering that if a company has gone through the process of putting you through the interview. Like you're probably not the only person they interviewed. They've probably put a bunch of time and effort into finding you, hiring you, giving you the job offer, training you for however long they've trained you. Um, typically they would much rather fix whatever the issue is than um, just like give up and try over with somebody new. Um, yep. So yep. yeah. All right, next one, strategies in walking the fine line with a senior dev to ask for help, but not to take too much of their time and bother them. Tips on how to ask for help. Um, I guess you could always just sit down 
or I mean, have a have a conversation at some point and try to get on the same page with that senior dev, especially if they're kind of maybe one of your main mentors, um, and get a get an idea of how much would be too much, or at what point would I be bothering you? Um, I know that we've talked. I loved how um, Amel put it last week that or maybe it was Sam, somebody last week was talking about how part of the job description of being a senior engineer basically is to mentor the younger, the, the juniors. Um, so I would say <laughs> you probably will feel like you're taking up too much of their time, but probably it's worth it in the long run and probably your threshold of taking up too much of somebody's time is different from their threshold like they probably can can give out more time than you're recognizing um yeah i'm yeah i'm i'm curious to hear sam's thoughts um I think you can start by just like scheduling one on ones. Like I said, if you don't have that in your company, like maybe with all the different senior devs, at least initially, then you can kind of feel like who's like, <laughs> who would be able to, who you would feel more comfortable working with and um, then form a relationship with them. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, like I said, you don't have to wait for companies, your manager or, hire up people to set up these one-on-ones. You can you can do it um, yourself. Um, so that's one way, just getting to know the team, then you can kind of, then you can kind of tell, like as you get to know the people, you, you know if they're, you're like bothering them and stuff like that. Um, so that's one thing. If your company doesn't have a mentorship program, like smaller companies probably don't have that, like Lyft has that luckily, like I have a mentor at Lyft. Um, I'm on my second mentor at Lyft, actually. Um, you can just set that up. Just talk to your manager and be like, can I get a dedicated like mentor? Like, <laughs> and then if you have a dedicated mentor, then that person is like, that's part of their job. Um, or, I mean, Brady said, like senior engineers should, that should be part of their job. But like, if you, if they're, actually like your mentor then i think um it would help because then you have like dedicated person that you can keep going to with questions or you can meet with them one-on-one -on -one weekly uh, if they have time um if not weekly if they're super busy you can try bi-weekly um bi-weekly should be fine um i think most people most senior engineers i think would be willing to do weekly i meet with my mentor weekly um, 30 minutes every week. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, gosh. Um, I have, I still have weekly meetups set with two different people. And so I'll try to, I'll try to get myself to a point where I'm stuck to be able to ask questions to the people that are mentoring me. Um, and if it's not at, if i'm not at that point and i get really really stuck then i can always slack my entire team and see if someone has some time to like talk through a problem um but it's usually good to like Anytime I ask about some big concept, I try to document it so that I can go back and look um, like, gosh, I, let's see, <laughs> I can't think, I mean, like the whole Redux pattern, uh, my team doesn't use Redux a ton, so I'll have to add something in Redux every couple of months and then not not look at it again. So I've got like a map that I tried to look at. Um, I've got it drawn out. And 
So stuff like that, if I've already got notes on it, I try to make sure that I'm looking through my notes or maybe looking through our entire company Slack history and see if somebody has asked a similar, similar question. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, Google and stuff. Slack um, is a good place to search besides Google. Yeah. When you work at a bigger company. Yeah. Again, like asking those questions in public in the actual channels instead of just DMs between people is really helpful for people in the future. And yep. I think once you've seen your own question get answered a couple of times because of being able to search in Slack or being able to search in the, the PR records, maybe that's when it's a little bit easier for you to recognize like, no, 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 I'm doing this for the greater good of the company and of future people with this question. It's, it's not all about how uncomfortable I'm feeling. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Asking the question in the Slack, that's another way to make sure you're not bothering people. Mm -hmm. If you ask in a public Slack channel, because anybody who, anybody can answer it. So like <laughs> if somebody's busy, they're not going to answer it. Right. So that's like a way to, get around that to make sure you're not bothering anybody and just ask in a public channel mm -hmm. or just ask on Twitter or on LinkedIn. <laughs> it's not just your company. Anybody in the world can answer your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's not like specific proprietary information to your company. All right. Next question here is how can we take initiative and be more proactive during the first couple of months of a junior developer role, especially if working remotely. Who take initiative like on I'm, ex I'm I interpret that as being like on the team in general and and contributing to the team. Um, in that case, I would say a lot of it like the first couple of months there's going to be a lot of ramp up in the first couple of months. Um, and what I can recognize now, things that I would have been capable of doing in the first couple of months would have been to just keep track. Luckily, there was a lot of documentation in place already when I started. And it helped me get my environment set up on my computer and figure out how to make my first PR. And there were a bunch of different things that I needed to be able to do. And it was wonderful and very helpful that there was documentation, but things change quickly. <laughs> so documentation gets stale quickly. And um, I had a lot of notes for my personal use on how I actually ended up getting through things, but being able to take those notes and actually update the documentation, um, it took me a while to realize that I, I could have been doing that and, and then it would have been available for every team and anybody who was joining our company instead of somebody just knowing like, oh, Brady just went through this and go talk to her. What did she do to, to fix this? Um, so update, updating any sort of documentation or like starting that documentation and figuring out where to put that, that would be exceptional. Um, yep. That's a good tip. Also, um, just asking a lot of questions. And like I said in the previous questions, being proactive and setting up one-on-ones or just like coffee chat or whatever, even though it's remote, you can still just... Yeah. <laughs> Just do like an informal, get to know all the people, could even be people on different teams. You can just set up. Then you can kind of figure out who's better, like just get to know people and like, I can ask this person like these kind of questions and this person, so you, just setting up informational meetings with all the different people at your company. Um, that's a good thing to do when you join a new company. Um, uh, I've learned that just because I've been at companies where that's kind of a part of the onboarding process. So I don't think I really thought about it before until I got to those companies where they're like, make sure you like set up coffee chats with some people this week or whatever. Um, or some of them do it automatically. They're just a bot that randomly like pairs mm -hmm. you with something. At Pivotal, they had a they had a bot. It was optional to sign up, but if you signed up for the bot, the bot would randomly pair with you somebody at the company for the week to go 
have coffee with them. So like that's a one donut or something. In yeah, I, yeah, I think we so. use that. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, people don't use that. Um, so yeah, just asking a lot of questions. Um, like uh, even asking people, like even in just this community, like um, uh, Eric Joe, who's gonna be one of our guests. He's he. I met him because I, I give talks at Rhythm School sometimes. I'm actually giving one next week, I think, um, to the graduating class just to tell them about my journey, how to how I got to where I am. And I do the same thing. I do ask me anything with them. Um, that's how I kind of got the idea for this meetup because I've been doing that at Rhythm School. So he was one of the students, like, I forget how long ago that was, maybe like three months ago or something. And now he got a job already. Um, and the thing I noticed that was different about him is he asked me a ton of questions. <laughs> he was always asking me questions. Even after he got his internship, he was like, how do I get better? Like, <laughs> he was like, what do I do for like, like what's the best way to like style the React components? Or like, how should I do this? Or like, what do you think about this? Like he was always asking me tons of questions. So he was like proactively trying to get better every single day. Like he's even, he was killing the hundred days of code too. Um, he was just doing it every day and posting what he's learning, what questions he had. Um, and he got a job and he asked a lot of questions <laughs> and uh, so I think it's correlated somehow but this comment yeah. is uh saying that he's a super positive guy i feel like that is so key in yeah he's like super oh <laughs> he's super gosh. posy he's super posy um a lot of the people that were the first of my network that were looking for junior dev jobs and then got the job that is something I absolutely noticed among all of them. They were like the most positive and upbeat person. And yeah. so it, it, part of it is just a personality trait, but if you can find, like I've told people to try to make a list of things that just make you happy and try to spend some time like each day, each week on these things that make you feel good um like going for a walk listening i made an entire playlist of songs that like put me in a really good mood um and i mean i it could be if i feel like i'm about to slip into a bad mood or it could be just like no i just want to listen to some happy music while i'm out for my walk and it honestly is um it's amazing what what that'll do because the more of a positive outlook you can have in general, the more um, like it just bleeds into different places. So if you were feeling doubtful about this job search, but then you can take some time aside in your day and just make make yourself feel a little bit happier than maybe you were going to feel it. It sounds kind of like, I don't know, it sounds like a, a really silly tip, but I think it's it's just so important to make sure that yeah. you are looking at life in like this really good uh, mindset. Yeah, just try and focus on the positive things. Yeah. Um, I think it helps you stay positive. Yeah, because I mean, there's, oh, sorry. Yeah, there's just a lot of crappy things happening. There. So if you dwell on all the crappy things happening, you're more likely <laughs> to even give off that energy to other people um yep so yep um so and yeah then also start surround yourself positive people like eric yeah. <laughs> they probably yeah. they probably will rub off on you yes um absolutely and hopefully you're able to see that a lot of things are going well like it's it's really easy to be very frustrated if you're doing this job search but like you've probably gone through the program at this point and have graduated a boot camp, or like who knows what your uh, 
I imagine if you are here right now, you have accomplished a lot towards this goal of yours to become a developer. So remember all of those things that you've accomplished and, and be really happy and proud about those things. All right, this question is, I'm at my first paid job. Congratulations, Haya. Is it normal if I get nervous unless I continuously get positive feedback and signs of approval? How much feedback should I seek? Yes, that I feel like is very, very, very normal. Very similar to the first question that was posted. Um, and I mean, it's, I would say hopefully you're able to be checking in with one-on-ones on your, uh, with your manager. Um, I remember feeling that exact feeling of needing this constant sign of approval from everybody. And um, I think that kind of comes back again to recognizing the stuff that you've been learning. Like, yeah, at some point you want to know that you're on track and that your manager thinks that you're doing a good job and is giving you some positive feedback. And um, it is kind of a slippery slope to give into that and need to rely on that. So um, try to keep focused on like making a list of all of the things that you've learned, making a keeping keeping track of if you have worked on any tickets, just keep track of the tickets that you've worked on in general. Doesn't matter if you needed help from people or not. Um, focus on stuff that you have already accomplished and let yourself try to be the source of the positive feedback that you have actually done all of this work. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Only thing I add is hitting home, set up one-on-ones <laughs> if you don't already have it. Uh, once a week feedback from your manager should be a pretty good cadence, I think. Yeah. Just for 30 sure. minute, 30 minute one-on-one -on -one with your manager. Yep. Just find out what you're doing good, what you can improve on, get career advice, all that kind of stuff. Yep. And um, it took me a while to be able to talk to my manager about uh, some sort of a career ladder. That was really, really helpful. Once I recognized, oh, I have these expectations for myself that are way higher than what the company expects someone in my position to be doing. Um, so if that's possible, that could be really helpful as well. All right, so how long of a runway do companies provide to gain a good footing with the code base? Communication strategies to update supervisor on learning um, and like when to ask help. Um, I think it depends on the company. That's what I was gonna say, yeah. Because if you're like in a small startup, sometimes it's like you gotta be able to hit the ground running, otherwise the company's gonna be dead. <laughs> um, so it depends like how much runway they have in cash. Um, normally, I think it does take a while to onboard into a company, no matter how senior of a dev you are. Um, just it can be like you gotta just learn all the all about the business. A yeah. part of being a good engineer is just really understanding the business of your company. Um, that helps you understand what you gotta build because there's always trade-offs for for building what you're gonna build. Um, so the most important thing I think when you get into a company is to understand the business really well and what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah, but, and that makes that reminds me of what you had mentioned meeting up with different people. Um, as an engineer, it might seem most obvious to try to meet up with other software engineers. But the nature of the first job that I had at my company, we did a lot of interacting with our customer service team. We talked to, um, so we're a personal styling company and we had um, like all of this custom fitting section of our business. So I, I learned about how we make our custom suits. Um, I really talked to people in almost every single department and 
it gave me such good context and I had a much better, much clearer idea of how we do business because of that. Um, obviously I felt a lot more comfortable reaching out to the people on the engineer team whenever I got stuck with a bug uh, because I had made that connection and had coffee with people. Uh, so it's yeah, very, very helpful to meet up with people and a lot less, um, it just makes sense for you to be like, if you're new at the company, like, oh, hi, I haven't met you yet. Would you ever want to put some time on the calendar and, and have a coffee and talk for a couple of minutes? Yeah. And yeah, just to let you know how long it can take to onboard at Pivotal, it took me like four months to <laughs> mm -hmm. onboard because I worked uh, it's pretty complicated their product and we we're expected to all be full stack engineers like full stack like from devops all the way to react um so that made it harder so the stack was because they do 100 percent pair programming so everybody's full stack you don't you don't specialize in something at pivotal um so that made it hard but they provide a lot of support they like had all these classes you could take like there's like week-long classes you could take on like just their like pivotal cloud foundry product they give you books and all kinds of stuff um so yeah it can take long it just depends on the company and the product so it's hard to give a straight <laughs> answer <laughs> that's like for this one it just it depends like a lot yeah. of things i would say yeah at trunk club we're we were an engineer team of maybe about 80 people when i started and it probably took me, yeah, four or five months to get onboarded. Um, a yeah. lot of our apprentices, I feel like the entire apprenticeship was their onboarding. So that was like a six month process. Um, but yeah, if it's a smaller company, it, it might, yeah. expectations might be different. I think the Lyft apprenticeship is eight months, I think. Or it's like eight to 12. I think you can do eight with optional, like four extra months or wow. something like that. Um, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's necessary. <laughs> Lyft, Lyft, um, not the easiest place if you just <laughs> like uh, applied to their regular software engineering role as a junior engineer, I think it would be really hard. So I'm really glad they have this mm -hmm. apprenticeship program. Yeah, that's really cool. And then looking at the second part of the question of communication strategies to update supervisor on learning and when to ask for help. Um, hopefully, if a person is a manager, hopefully they have their own ideas of this, uh, of when you might ask for help. Um, communication strategies, it's, I found it really helpful uh when i switched teams to my current manager i thought it was brilliant that my manager it also just helped that i happened to join the team in the spring time so weather was nice and whenever weather was nice my manager prefers especially like also when we're in person my manager prefers to go out for a walk and um i just noticed it was a lot easier to talk <laughs> to him while we were out walking and like doing something and so that that's, made communication really natural that's kind of common i think a lot of managers will do that i think yeah i like that um and so gosh communication strategies <laughs> I'm, I'm getting stuck on that i besides just like having a really open communication with your manager which that that uh going for walks made it easy for me to be really open with him. Um, I'll have to think more on that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Besides the one on ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. This person is two weeks into the second to last week, second to last class at Lambda. Uh, struggle with, I um, struggle with, am I good enough to land a job? I just started studying for the solutions architect exam. Cool. Um, I guess the thing that 
take some time to let it soak in is, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know you, but the thing that comes up over and over again is people can learn, people can be taught. Um, people, it might, it might take a different amount of time for different people, but I believe that everybody would be able to, like if, if a person is able to, gosh, I'm thinking of even a lot of people with like learning disabilities, I think a lot of people would be able to make it to get to a job. Um, I'm also not quite sure what the question is besides like, <laughs> am I good enough to get the job? <laughs> but um, <Yeah. laughs> my, my recommendation is, I know it's hard, but try not to think about the getting to the job, getting the job part, especially if you have um, savings, so you don't have to like get a job right away. And if you don't, if you have family or friends, you can move in with to extend your runway it's better in my opinion to focus on just getting better at coding um if you learn in public and you just focus on getting better every day a little bit my opinion is the job will come to you mm -hmm. <laughs> um so that's at least the approach i took i just kept coding i didn't apply for jobs i didn't think about getting a job i just kept coding every day after boot camp and then when I finally was like completely almost out of money, then um, luckily I, I got a job, but it was just from someone I, it happened because of someone I just talked to at a meetup. <laughs> I think I told this story a bunch of times already. I used to go to Code for America hack nights and uh, I used to just work on projects there. And one of the people there was from that boot camp. Like I said, all of my jobs came from my dev bootcamp network. I was just talking to them about what, what they did and then they were saying they did contract work and they didn't want to do it anymore. And he just passed it off to me. Um, so. And I just, actually, so I wonder. It, it, it could be part luck too, but um, I think it kind of works if you're just out there coding, doing hackathons, doing this mint bean stuff that I think I see people doing now, um, all that kind of stuff. People just will notice, and I think, I think the job will eventually come to you. So if you can extend your runway and just live rent free somehow, then you can just focus on getting better at coding. Yeah, I I also wonder. That was kind of like a. If you weren't focusing on getting a job, it feels like maybe a lower stakes situation i wonder if you had a different experience of like maybe feeling less imposter syndrome than or like um yeah i guess less imposter syndrome maybe than what i had felt when i got a job i don't know what your situation was once you started at that contracting job but you had proven to yourself over and over and over again that you were able to figure out whatever yeah. you needed to figure out but still, I, I don't learn that fast, so it's still, hmm. yeah, but I don't know. I mean, I can't compare it because. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible <laughs> to ever compare, right? <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I I don't learn as fast. Like, even though I had a computer science background, there were people in my cohort at the boot camp that like smoked me. Hmm. <laughs> they, just, they went from zero to like way past me mm -hmm. just in the nine weeks at that boot camp. Mm -hmm. um, so. Again, yeah, the I, comparisons, I, I, darn. <laughs> yeah, um, um, yeah, it's kind of hard not to, right? But like, um, I did. I, I mean, I didn't get down about that. I like, I like found inspiration from those people. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, like, um, so I just tried to focus on just getting better. It's easier to just focus on one thing if you have that freedom to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, here, this one is, as a career pivoter, I used to work closely with other people daily on projects. As a junior dev, it gets lonely, especially remote. Is working alone inherent to coding? Um, 
I would say it doesn't have to be. I know right now everyone is remote. Everyone is like stuck at home for the most part everywhere. Um, so I understand that, yeah, it, it can feel much more lonely. Um, I would say almost half of my days are meetings right now. Um, there are a lot of meetings in my days where I'm on some sort of like video call with everyone else on my team. Um, it's not my whole day. Some other positions, yeah, it's their whole day. I also tend to do a fair amount of pair programming. Um, and then again, like some companies are 100% pair programming, right? I think that's certainly something that you could talk to a company about before you accept an offer to get a feel for is pair, pro pair programming common um, and what do the what's the day-to-day -day look like for the engineers how many meetings are there where you would get human interaction yeah i have a lot of meetings too <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i haven't actually had a in-person conversation with a human since the first week of march um and somehow i'm not lonely i think it's because I talk to more people now than I did <laughs> before this lockdown because like because of this meetup and just everybody like my friends are organizing like trivia nights on like Zoom and stuff like that and uh I feel like I'm talking to way more people and it's just not I'm talking to them in person. I even talk to people in VR. <laughs> I go I go to um Bitcoin meetups in VR. Um people are like avatars, like giving presentations and stuff. The world is getting weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I noticed that also, especially in March. Gosh, um, I was talking to people all the time that I hadn't talked to. Um, yeah, so I think the combination of my meetings throughout the day and then making a point to interact with people outside of work yeah. or having some specific time to do that is good. And like I said, you can set up one-on-ones with people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing a comedy show where they bring up the same, <laughs> the same thing over and over throughout the set. Cool. Um, next one, in studying confidence and imposter syndrome, what have you learned about how gender plays into these? Oh, goodness. <sighs> yeah, I think, gosh, that is a scary topic. <laughs> I do think that there is a lot at play in just like how we are socialized when we grow up. Um, and I haven't looked at a ton of research. Um, Just let us know what you think, Brady. Oh, <laughs> gosh. So one of the things that I had read was that it's like imposter syndrome is uh, potentially more widespread among men than women. However, when women feel imposter syndrome, um wait this is the opposite the, the i got it reversed already uh it's potentially more widespread among women versus men however when men feel imposter syndrome they feel it much deeper than what some women feel and one of the ideas was like maybe society puts more pressure on men to be like providers and be extremely financially successful. And so then they end up feeling this weight on them more. Um, I don't know. I felt some pretty crazy imposter syndrome. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I've also heard that like for applying for jobs, people, in marginalized communities, which would like definitely include just in general women applying for a tech role, 
they'll react a, very differently to be failing an interview. So if, if they've like failed one interview, they might be less likely to like get back into the saddle and, and just plowing ahead and, and being okay with failing a second interview, which is tough because a lot of people will take maybe an average of like 25 failed tech interviews to get their job. I'm very sorry if that freaks you all out. <laughs> it's it's not for it's not the number that everyone will end up hitting, but I would say that's totally totally normal to go into 25 interviews without getting an offer. Um, yeah, I've done a ton of interviews. Yeah. I've done multiple interviews with the same company. I've interviewed at Facebook 3 times, never made it on site. <laughs> So I guess I haven't learned a ton, but it's something that I'm, I'm reading a uh, Sheryl Sandberg book right now that lean in. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I feel like at least in my family, it's common to just kind of explain everything away and be like, yeah, but you don't know the whole situation. Whereas people have done actual research and, and found that there are differences in how we perceive other people, how we perceive ourselves compared to other people. There's a lot going on there. Um, I'm moving on. I don't know what else to say about that one. Yeah, I don't know what to say about it either. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. It's a great question. I'm gonna keep digging into it though. All right, um, so what advice would you give for a junior who feels like their work is not good enough because they don't have a degree to show? Um, Degrees are meaningless. Yeah. <laughs> for software engineers. Um, was, that, was it you I was talking to? Their company is starting to discover that, I don't think it was you actually, um somebody's company is now realizing they prefer to hire boot camp grads as opposed to cs grads because the boot camp grads have actual experience building things and usually a lot more like passion um versus somebody who's been going at a steady pace for like maybe four years that was kind of crazy for me to hear because I very much was afraid. I had that same thought. Um, I had talked to a friend of mine who was an engineering manager and had been in, been in the industry for probably two decades as I was starting to go think about going to a boot camp and had been told that he personally would not hire a boot camp grad. Um, come to find out, he has changed his mind and is hiring boot camp grads now and <laughs> also told me that if I was ever looking for a job, even though I don't have a CS degree, I should talk to him because he'd like to hire me. So I think, yeah, degrees are not all they're like built up to be. Yeah, I don't know if you can even use that to like tell who's gonna be better. There's so many awesome devs that they didn't even graduate high school. Like even yeah. our past guest, Jason Sewell. Yeah. He dropped out of high school. Yeah. And like he awesome <laughs> software yeah. engineer. Very successful career. He even started his own boot camp for a while. He's done all kinds of stuff. He's high school dropout. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. So I mean a lot of the a lot of the founders of giant tech companies today yeah almost all of them i think don't the have companies. degrees so, <laughs> they um, all dropped out yeah it took me a while for me to convince my parents that that was the case because my mom is very like traditional it's a but, different world don't yeah. listen to advice from boomers yeah <laughs> that's that's the takeaway the world here. is completely different from when they grew up <laughs> yeah okay next question i'm worried it may take me too long to resolve problems and solutions in my first job i think 
I'm probably I th okay, but when I've paired with people who are so fast, yeah. So don't compare yourself. <laughs> I don't. It's <laughs> uh, it's like the advice. It's impossible to take, but um, I yeah, just keep keep working. Also, I think for some of it, it depends on what kind of problems that you're you're looking at. Um, if this yeah. is like algorithms, remember that, especially in web development, algorithms are not going to be a good indicator of what you'll do on the job in general and, and how you will do on the job. Um, and sometimes it just takes uh, being able to practice with other people and understand what is a good way to solve a problem and, and what are good ways to eliminate what might be the problem. Um, I have picked up a lot of tips from people that I've paired with over the years. And if you're just pairing with other people that are maybe around your skill level, skill level but faster, those people might not be able to articulate what they're doing to be able to solve a problem quickly. Um, so, if you're able to talk to somebody who can actually give you some, like talk through their thought process, that might be more helpful. Um, I, I don't think that like, gosh, I've been stuck on problems for a long time sometimes. And then I've also been able to solve some problems fast. So it's, yeah. it's the, yeah, go ahead, Sam, sorry. No, I was just going to say, it, you get better at it over time. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of junior developers are impatient to just <laughs> become a senior engineer like overnight. Um, it's just, you just get better little by little as you start coding a lot and reviewing other people's PRs and stuff. Your brain just starts noticing patterns. And over time, you don't really notice it, but you start solving problems faster because you seen this pattern over and over and over in things that work and you really learn when you mess something up um, <laughs> when yep. something ends up not being a good decision and it becomes obvious later then you're like your brain is like well i'm never doing that again <laughs> i broke the it's like this code is like really hard to work with and it's hard to like build stuff on it now um so you'll just get better um, just got to be patient. And as long as you just keep coding, and if you're coding for a job, you're coding every day, at least Monday to Friday. So you're going to get better unless you're doing something that doesn't require problem solving, like you're just doing the same thing yeah. over and over. But normally in a software engineering job, the problems are always different. You'll do some things over and over, but then there's always going to be stuff you're going to have to figure out. And it just takes time. Absolutely. And sometimes people will warn you of things that you won't understand until you mess it up. <laughs> I People tried to tell me how to not query a database. And I was like, I don't understand what you mean. It will break the database. Or like, it'll, it'll uh, blow up the database. <laughs> and then I wrote a bad query that hadn't been indexed. And boy, <laughs> I heard about it. <laughs> So yeah, it takes time. Okay, the last few jobs I applied required code signal hacker rank coding assessments. Why work on side projects when these are always asked for about in tech interviews? Hmm. Um, I guess, so I haven't had those. I know that there, like, there are companies that will ask for that. Um, I wonder if this is a regional issue. Um, and I also wonder, like, the thing that I have heard from a lot of people is they'll maybe get an interview and then they will talk 
to whoever they need to talk to, maybe the hiring manager or someone else, and then they'll get the um, they'll get the feedback that we went with someone else who had more experience. And so my reasoning for telling people to work on projects and working on open source and trying to get involved in stuff like Code for America is to get experience to talk about in your interviews. Um, and it, it continues to frustrate me that this is the case that people are running into. Yeah, I also think you'll become a better coder just by working on side projects that you're interested in. Because then coding becomes something you want to do and not a chore that yeah. you have to <laughs> yeah. do every day. And the people who get really good is they work, they have like, a passion project it's not a side project it's something they really care about um so they just code all day on it just because like that's all they're like thinking about um so they get really good because they're coding all day on this project and um if it's if you really if you ship all your projects and you start getting users that's gonna help you get interviews more than being good at um, lead code or, or hacker rank. Um, so those things are good. Maybe just to like, um, if you're applying to like fan companies and stuff, it mm -hmm. will help you. If you get an interview, it will help you make it through the interview process. But so like, you kind of got to do both, I think, like, unfortunately, but I like, I rather just have fun. Then do stuff that yeah. <laughs> do stuff that's not fun to me. Um, but yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I one of the girls that I know that recently got a job. I would love for her to maybe come talk to you all, but she she didn't even like. We had talked a lot about imposter syndrome at one point, and I had tried to talk to, I, I tried to drive home that interviewing is, the point of interviewing is to get a good fit for both parties. And me personally, if, if the company is focused so much on like hacker rank stuff and these like algorithm challenges, I don't think that's a good fit for me personally. Um, and then we had that conversation and she had this interview a couple days later and we had also talked about how I was hoping she could view that interview process, the, the tech interview as more of a help, like make the goal to be able to describe your thought process instead of making the goal to be solve the question correctly. And that's what she did. And she pseudo coded everything out and then ran out of time and didn't even write any actual code. And she got the job. So um, like jobs exist out there that don't necessarily rely on being a really fast, really strong algorithm solver. Um, I do wonder if maybe right now that's an extra layer that's been added to a lot of interviews to be able to weed people out potentially. <sighs> it's stupid <Yeah>. though. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people trying to come up with alternatives. So yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes over the next few years. Yeah. All I right. A question this about the, the conversation in the chat. What is, what is lunch club? What does anybody want to chime in about that? Do you know what that is, Brady? I, I've never heard of it. No. People are talking about it in the chat. <laughs> uh, maybe we can talk about it after if nobody yeah. wants to jump on. Yeah. It's a one-on-one -on -one pairing site. Oh, okay. Kind of like uh, what I picture. Uh, what's the one that we've talked about here for practicing interviewing? Um, oh. Pramp. Pramp, yeah. Also interviewing IO. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Cool. Um, 
here's this next question. Do you think people ever use imposter syndrome as an excuse like to not get better or not learn? That's an interesting question. I have identified like, yeah, totally. I, I yes and no. I absolutely felt like I I would get frustrated because there would be so many uh, so many, so much that I just didn't, I couldn't figure out on my own when I was first starting, like during the time when I was job searching kind of, um, and it ended up paralyzing me. So there was a good chunk of time when I was trying to go meet my friend at a coffee shop and we would try to motivate each other to work at this coffee shop and I would just get stuck. And then that was the end of the day, basically. I would just kind of stare at my computer and feel sorry for myself and feel bad. And I wasn't smart about the way to get over these problems. I mean, I had Twitter, I had um, Stack Overflow. I knew a person that was an engineer and he had kind of been mentoring me. Um, I had the whole community of people that went to dev boot camp. So I wasn't smart about the ways that I chose to handle that situation. Um, and I let it stop me a lot of times. Um, I don't know if it was like an excuse. Looking back, I guess I could, I can give myself some tough love and be like, come on, snap yourself out of it. Um, but I feel like it's more of a, it's the root cause, maybe not so much the excuse. And I, I was, I was in so deep that I couldn't pull myself out far enough to realize, like, there are a bunch of different options to get through this. Um, yeah, my, my brain just didn't work like that automatically, but it's, it's, it's starting to really think more in, in the ways that I need it to think to be able to build more things. Um. Yeah, I agree that it's more a cause rather than uh, excuse. Because if you have imposter syndrome, you're probably thinking that you can't get better or you can't reach a certain level. Yeah. When if you just got to um, lower your time preference and know it's going to take a long time to, <laughs> yeah. to, get, to get good at this um, and just learn a little bit every day you just learn a little bit you learn one small thing every day like over a year that adds up to like a lot of things that you like learned and so have you ever heard of that like one percent rule where if you can improve one yeah. percent over the year it compounds into this insanely yeah. that's in that's in atomic habits right i mean it's probably, probably. said all over the place but yeah. i think it, he talks about that in the book too yeah yeah. Um, okay. Are there any common glaring areas of deficiency in junior developers which can help to work on and stand out as a candidate? Um, my mind goes just to mindset again. Yeah. Of, like every single time you get really, really stuck. Um, recognizing that it's still a problem that you can work through and figure out and you can still be excited to to learn that the answer to whatever it is you need to learn um, it seems to me to a lot of junior own engineers overthink everything <laughs> and just need to just like just try stuff yeah and, see what happens because you, you you learn by just trying things and being like oh that doesn't work yeah um, but some a lot of junior developers will just sit there like thinking like for a really long time like will this thing work and the fastest way to find out if it works is to just like try it out and see what happens or um that's one thing and i think um i notice um they're afraid to like let you know what they don't know 
<laughs> and they could get better a lot faster if they're just upfront and be like, I don't understand any of the words coming out of your mouth. Can we like <laughs> step it down a little bit and go over like, I don't know what this means, that word you said, rather than just being like, okay, I understand when you don't understand anything that I'm saying. Um, you just need to be able to be more assertive, I think, and just be like, oh, whoa, whoa, stop. I don't understand. Let's talk about these smaller pieces. Um, I think it'll help you get better faster, just owning what you don't know. Totally. Um, it it felt so nice the first couple of times I heard people who I recognized were much more experienced than I was, much more senior than I was. Uh, a couple of meetings, people would be talking and saying a bunch of words that I didn't know anything that was going on, but I didn't feel comfortable saying like, uh, can you help me, <laughs> can you bring me up to speed? And then one day somebody said something and another senior engineer was like, I think I know some of those words. <laughs> like basically he also <laughs> didn't know what was going on and had the other person explain. And it, it can happen really quickly, you know, like, we all can get kind of siloed into our own projects and there's just so much to learn in tech. So it can happen frequently, even within the same company that you need other people to slow down and explain themselves, no matter, no matter what your level is. Yep. All right. Aside from algorithms and data structures, what did you find most beneficial thing to learn post bootcamp? Um, goodness. Um, <laughs> I think, um, I think it, oh yeah, right, go ahead. It sounds like you had it. No, I was going to just say like, just learning to be more patient and lowering my time preference to just focus on getting better a little bit at a time rather than how do I get to be a senior developer? Yeah. <laughs> Instead of focusing on that, just focusing on just getting better a little bit every single day. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was gonna talk about like mindset because it was definitely discussed in our boot camp. Yep. But I don't think like I was just kind of grinding in the boot camp and trying to uh, get through the program. And then after the boot camp and after the job started, that's when I had a little bit more time to like have emotions maybe. <laughs> and so that, as we've discussed, that's when I, like after I got my job is when I started really comparing myself to other people like on my team. It's when I, felt most paralyzed probably by imposter syndrome throughout that whole process. And I, because of the boot camp, had purchased the book Mindset by Carol Dweck. And Me too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was how I got through a lot of like really down nights because I would just sit down and feel terrible about how little I had accomplished throughout the day because I was too afraid to ask questions. And I would read a couple of pages of the book and I would remember that there are a lot of very smart people out there in the world that just shamelessly ask questions and they wouldn't get to the level that they're at without asking those questions. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I, I had, wonder. oh. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I think I had uh, read some interview. I don't know if it was like with Elon Musk or if it was, I think it was like someone was commenting on Elon Musk and his like work ethic or just him in general. And they were talking about how he is just not afraid to ask the most stupid, basic questions just to make sure that he really understands things. Um, 
And I would not consider Elon Musk a stupid person. <laughs> I feel like what he has done is very impressive and he's gonna just keep doing really cool things. Yeah, and um, as far as technically, um, I think Amel said it well last week, just fundamentals. Yeah. That's why I like execute program. It's all fundamental like knowledge and even though I've been doing JavaScript a long time, it's pretty impossible to learn everything in JavaScript. So I still continue to I uh, do stuff like execute program. I still watch front end masters, like uh, all the will sentence JavaScript courses on front end masters are super awesome. All the JavaScript, the hard part series. Um, and that's all fundamentals of JavaScript. Um, I study that because I work with JavaScript mm -hmm. all day. So it depends what you're going to be working on. So if you want to like figure out what to work on technically, I try to focus on just what I need at the time. Otherwise, you forget. <laughs> but um, fundamentals are a good thing because like you can use that no matter where you go to. Yeah, um, I've I also talked to another junior who's doing a job search right now, and he had made the decision after he graduated to just focus on the fundamentals in JavaScript, and then he got to a point where he was worried maybe that he had forgotten all of the backend, like all of the Ruby that he'd learned, and so now he's kind of going back and doing some projects with Ruby, and he realized that things make a lot more sense now that he gave himself the time to really absorb and learn JavaScript concepts. A lot of the things are pretty similar in Ruby to the object-oriented JavaScript. So um, it's going to help you across the board if you learn the fundamentals, for sure. Cool. Um, I'm currently in a self-paced boot camp. With my day job, I'm behind on my course compared to my cohort and getting major imposter syndrome. Is this normal? Interesting. I have actually not heard of a self-paced boot camp. Um, I mean, I can't imagine that, like, if you're doing a self-paced boot camp and you're doing a day job, I can't that's, imagine, like, whew. that's That's rough. Yeah, yeah. that's a lot. That's a whole lot. Um, springboard. Okay, I've heard of this springboard. And yeah, I, didn't, has I, okay. I didn't know that was a self-paced bootcamp. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like if it's self-paced, this must be common. <laughs> Some people have crazier day jobs than other people. Um, I, gosh, I was trying to teach myself how to code before I decided to quit and do dev bootcamp. Um, I was working as an executive assistant at that time. So my days, like every single second of my day was filled. And I was always trying to figure out how to fit the most into my day. It was just very stressful. <laughs> I didn't always have time to get up and go get water. Um, yeah, that's a lot to do your day job and then go home and try to put in the yeah. mental bandwidth to learn. So yeah. give yourself some credit there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to do about that. That's tough one. I mean, if you're, yeah, this someone is talking about putting in a, a bunch of nights and weekends, and if you're if if you only have like one day a week to really put in a ton of mental bandwidth, yeah, maybe that'll be different from what the rest of your cohort is able to do. So you don't have to be comparing yourself to the other people in your cohort. Um, it sounds like maybe you can like drop back into the, the next cohort. Heck, I was doing a full-time program and I had to repeat a couple of times where people in my cohort got ahead of me and graduated before me. but it'd be, I feel like it's better to learn now and really understand the content versus just fly forward and 
maybe forget 90% of what you were learning. Yeah. Yeah, if it's possible, just <laughs> just like we said, just try and focus to make sure that you are just, you are getting better a little by little. Mm -hmm. um, if it helps, you can journal about like what you learned every day. Like during that boot camp, there are a lot of, they encouraged everybody to write blog posts and stuff like that. Um, so then you can look back at what you learned and no, then it's just like obvious that you got better from like, if you look at the previous 30 days, I'm pretty sure you, you'll notice that you learned a bunch of stuff in that 30 days. For sure. Okay, what's the ideal cold approach uh, email for a recruiter? Start off friendly, link re resume and portfolio, or save resume portfolio for a second email? Um, so we've talked about contacting recruiters here. I would, gosh. Um, yeah. So, yeah. The one thing I want to make sure to mention is I see a huge difference between a third party recruiter and a recruiter that is hiring internally. Um, the third party recruiters probably are not going to be able to help you so much because those are recruiters that get a lot of money from the company that ends up hiring you, um, like headhunters and a lot of companies have discovered that they can do just a good of job at finding that talent, uh, finding people like straight out of a CS degree or a boot camp, compared to a recruiter who maybe doesn't know the teams as well. Um, they're going to be given like taking a chance on anyone that's in the junior position anyway. So that's something to keep in mind, I guess. Um, and I mean, Sam, you've written a lot of cold emails to people. <laughs> even the internal recruiter, that's not who I would contact. Um, yeah. I think it's better to contact the engineers or managers inside the company because um, they can champion for you. Um, so if you code outreach to people, just research the person, look at their. Um, profile, follow them for a while on social media, try to like um, see what they're all about. And then if you can, uh, if they have given talks, watch their YouTube talks, or if you've seen them talk in person, almost all the time when I see like an in-person talk and I resonate with it, I reach out to the person almost immediately and just let them know I'm like, that talk was awesome. I like this, this, this. So if I send their connection request, I add that note then they know that I'm not just connecting with random people. Um, I really did like their thought, I, I, their talk. I didn't like make it up just to connect with them. <laughs> so if you can be genuine, I think people can tell. Um, a lot of the times they'll be more willing to um, have a chat with you. I think like if you can find some kind of common thing that you're both interested in, um, then you can start off your email. Like a lot of the guests we get on here, I cold email them. I don't know all the guests, the ones that I've found for this um, meetup. I just cold contact them, let them know. Like a lean learner, I saw her give her talk before. I took classes at Bradfield School of Computer Science. So I think I, I like learning. I think I, I, I don't even, I think education is always worth it, even though it costs a lot of money. I think <laughs> um, maybe not university, that's pretty expensive, but like I take one-off classes at like um, Bradfield and it's like 1800 bucks, but I like, I get a huge network from it and I get like to go to these talks. I saw a lean learner give a talk. That was years ago. And I just called the email there and they're like, I saw you give a talk two years ago at Bradfield. I do a meetup with junior developers. You have a product that supports like developers getting jobs. Here's like all these videos of past guests. Do you want to be a guest? Like I, 
I make it like a yes or no question so they don't, <laughs> it's like easy to reply. And she pretty much just answered like, yes, I'm in. That was her <laughs> email reply. It was like three words. I just made it easier for her to reply. And I do that for all the people I code apply. I think I give specific dates and times. So like, if you want to chat with somebody, just be like, whatever. I like what you're doing with this. I saw your talk, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I know you're super busy, but if you have some time to chat, I'm available at this time, but I'm flexible. So if that doesn't work, uh, maybe we can chat some other time or if you're too busy, that's okay. Just make it easy for them to reply. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's very try important. To it, <laughs> try to keep it kind of short. Like if I think if you write like 5,000 words, they're <laughs> not gonna like read it all. Yeah. Um, Cause some of our inboxes are just crazy. Um, so. I, yeah, uh, asking like very specific questions, asking, like offering up the times. Um, I've gotten a couple of interactions yeah. from people where uh, people will. Oh. What? <laughs> What's <Yeah>. up? <laughs> What you want? <laughs> tell them in a, tell them listening. <laughs> hey. Yeah. What is it? You don't want me. I'm trying to figure out if I can. Oh, now we're maybe we're <laughs> muted. Okay. <laughs> um. What was I gonna say? Oh. <laughs> that, that, um. I've had a couple of people write me a message and just say, hey, can I ask you a question? And it honestly takes me a couple of days to get back to them and be like, yeah, please go for it. Ask me a question if you want some advice. Um, it, it, if the person could just write me the first time and, and ask that direct question, um, that'd be a lot easier for me. So keep that in mind maybe also. And then the question was like, should you actually link the resume and portfolio? I think it would save the person time if if you're going straight in for the for a job that that would save time. But I think it's typically probably more likely that they would just talk to you in general um, versus just giving out a job type thing. Yeah, like also like I said before, it's patience. Uh, I think it's better to build up relationships first <laughs> rather than just come out and be like, do you have a job for me? Mm -hmm. um, it's better to, that's why, I say, that's why I recommend people try to extend their runway because I think it's better to just lower your time preference, not only for just building your skills, but like for building your network too. It, it takes time to build out a good network, but like, I think it pays off in the long run. So the longer you can survive without like having a job, you can just focus on just getting better a little bit every day, meeting new people every day. Even if it's just one person a day, your network is getting bigger every day. I think if you focus on just connecting with one new developer every day, like that increases your chances, I think, of. Totally. eventually getting a job even if they're a junior because then they might get a job and then if that company's hiring juniors they might want to hire more um they can like bring you into that company yeah this next question is i've been six months into the job search should i branch uh should i branch out to looking for other roles like solutions or test engineer rather than just dev roles? It depends I'm, how bad you need a job, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> because okay. my my opinion is like you you should just continue focus on getting better coding and the job will eventually come. Yeah. Um I agree. I think the more 
precise. If you've got this vision of what you want to do and you've got the experience of having built things as a developer, I say keep going for that if you can. Uh, six months when, like the past three months, I feel like you can't necessarily even count as part of your job search. You've yeah. hopefully, hopefully you've gotten better at some of those jobs. And six too. months is not that long too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, again, I think it's more, um, people need to lower their time preferences if they can. I know some people have families, they got to feed and stuff. So um, the answer is different <laughs> depending on who's asking. Yeah. Well, that was helpful. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, personally, I wouldn't branch out. I would keep keep going. Yeah. And um, if you do take those jobs because you need income, um, just make sure you continue outside of work, um, working on your developing your skills as a developer. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. And I guess it also depends on like, was that an interest of yours when you went into this whole process and yeah. you couldn't find a program suited specifically for those jobs? So you went with developing? It, it does depend a lot on your situation, I guess. Also, you could just try it out. Maybe you like doing that better than <laughs> a, a normal software engineering job. Like, as long as you're happy, right? You don't need to make a million dollars a year to be happy. <laughs> OK, uh, last question here. As a job se seeking junior developer, does work-life balance return once you get a job? Or does work and life get even more intense, job seeking 24 seven and skill building is a job itself for sure. Um, for me, yeah, I had a lot more work-life balance once I had my job. A lot of that I think was dependent on the company that I joined. Um, it just so happened that my manager had two little kids at home and so it, five o'clock on the dot he would pack up his things and go home um i mean he was laser focused pretty much the whole day so he was getting his job done uh, but it was really important for him to be able to go home at the end of the day so that kind of that culture was certainly a part of our team um it's probably something that you would want to ask about in a uh here we hadn't talked about it yet but the key values <laughs> for <laughs> queries um yeah and it also depends on you i think because <laughs> you can decide what um kind of work-life balance you want like if you just if you don't care about like becoming like a principal engineer then like who cares right you don't need to like grind super hard to like keep getting super good to move up to that point um then you can just go to work and go home and not code at all if you don't like coding outside of work so it depends on you um and if you how much you enjoy coding like i i, I do it as a hobby but not everybody is like that you know <laughs> some people just want to do it for their job um that's fine, I think. Um, you you still get better. You're still coding for the whole day at work. Um, so yeah. yeah. So again, it, it depends. <laughs> um, here, and somebody just asked where we can watch previous recordings. Here. Also, the meetup has. Um, Hit the subscribe button. And the bill. <laughs> I I feel very paranoid telling people subscribe to my channel, but I'm so grateful for Sam for being my PR person. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to. I'm not. <laughs> um, you, can, you just gotta you just gotta shield yourself. 
<laughs> no, no, no shame. <laughs> oh, I think I are, I put away. Here we go. Okay, what are some key characteristics of a solid first junior dev job? If lucky enough to compare two options, which company and position should you choose, like salary aside? Were you seeing this question, or did you turn I, it off? Or... I accidentally archived it. Um, <laughs> oh, let me see. Because I, yeah, someone put on a new question, and I thought that that meant, yeah, <laughs> my brain is a scary place. <laughs> um, oh, I'm being told to be more confident. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can do it. <laughs> All right. I just don't want to be like disingenuous. I don't want people to be like, oh, she only hosts this happy hour for um, subscribers. Remember Gary V said, who cares what other people think? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. But for this, I would say, I mean, a lot of it is going to be your preference, right? But if you could find a company with at least 50 people in the tech team, that would be a very ideal scenario. Um, I personally have really enjoyed being on a team with fewer than, or like around between 50 and 100 people on our tech team, because that's meant that the company is small enough that we can really run with changes when we think of things that maybe should be changed. Um, if you get onto a bigger company, there might be a lot of opportunities that come with it, but you might not be able to make as much impact on the company, I guess. Um, I've, I've thought that that was pretty fun. Um, I would say if you have the opportunity to join a company with languages that you're really familiar in versus languages that you're not familiar in, Personally, I would prefer the languages I'm familiar with uh, and, and like frameworks that I've worked with. Um, the company itself is is the company like I years and years ago before I was in engineering, I worked at a company that created cutting tools, and I'm not like super gung ho about learn about all what tools are available to be purchased. I, I like spent more time going to the mall and buying clothes, for example. So if I had had the opportunity to be an engineer at that cutting tool company versus Trunk Club where we sell clothes, I probably would have chosen the one that I had the interest in in the business idea um, and ended up at Trunk Club. Um, yeah. what else? Um, yeah, I think most people recommend bigger companies, but I think there are benefits to joining small startups as well. I mean, my first full time was at a small startup. Um, it's, it's not as stable, <laughs> but it's fun because it's, like a small group of people so you get closer i think with the people and it's just like going to hang out with your friends um but it's more pressure because if you screw up the company could just die um <laughs> so there are trade-offs it's like more fun you get thrown into the fire so you really got to figure stuff out but you don't there's no one to like hold your hand you have to go out into the world and ask other people questions outside of your company, um, which I did all the time because I had to do like hard stuff that I didn't know how to do. And I just would ask people outside of the company, how would you do this? How do you do this? I have no idea how to do this. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So again, it, it depends. <laughs> I think it depends on the person. My personal opinion too is you, you should just take whatever job you can get as long as um, it's not like a toxic workplace, um, which you can get some red flags in the interview process. Mm -hmm. 
I uh, I heard of somebody asking a question about like who is the most toxic coworker you work with when they were doing kind of an informational interview, and I thought that was a pretty good way. Uh, luckily, the answer was there is no toxic person. <laughs> and I was like, that's a decent way to try to figure out how how well people get along on the team. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. The last question. And this is longer than our normal. <laughs> yeah, it was. Our, our normal meetup when we have guests. <laughs> um, are there noticeable differences in the job market during this quarantine period? Remote availability, number of candidates, laid off crowd. Um, I'm assuming that's like comparing it to not quarantine period. And I would say definitely. Yeah, unfortunately, this is like a downward cycle. I have started to notice a lot of people on LinkedIn and a lot of people that I've been working with uh, trying to help them get jobs have started getting jobs. So hopefully that trend continues as well. Who knows? Um, but yeah, a lot of companies in the past couple of months have just like not been hiring. Um, and a lot of layoffs had happened. So I feel like there's probably a lot more competition for among the people who are looking for jobs. Um, there's definitely the difference in number of candidates um, is, yeah. is noticeable. I mean, even just look at the economy, like the unemployment rate is above 10%, <laughs> just craziness. Yeah. Um, just a lot of uncertainty makes it harder for companies to hire. They don't know, they can't predict what their business is gonna be like later on this year. So it makes hiring harder for the companies. Totally. Um, remote availability potentially has gone up. Um, I mean, people are all remote most, right now, yeah. Most companies will tell you though that <laughs> they're still going to be like on site, but they don't know when they're going to require that again. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of companies that have like committed to like switching to like being definitely remote from here on out. Yeah. <sighs> um, yeah. So those are the, those are the differences that I've noticed. Um, yeah, and like there's no in-person like hiring events and stuff like that. Like San Francisco has that kind of stuff all the time. There's like a monthly meetup where it's like front-end developer hiring event. I would go to that even <laughs> when I wasn't looking for a job. I, I'm just interested to see what companies are doing. Um, so like now you can't, it's harder to do that kind of stuff. So everything is just hard right now. Yeah. Yep. Is that meetup still happening? It might be. I'll I'll try to look it up and post a link in the in the Slack later. They might be doing it virtually. Um I haven't been looking at meetup that much. Usually I look at meetup every day or like at the beginning of the week. I usually look at the meetup app, but I haven't been doing that recently. Um there's just a lot less meetups. Not a lot of them have switched to being virtual. Because I still go, like when things were normal, I still went to at least one meetup a week, I think. Um, so, I mean, that's taking advantage of living in some place like San Francisco where they have meetups every day from Monday through Friday, like tons of meetups you can choose from. Um, it's it's kind of fun because you can go check out like they have them at all the different tech companies and you can go see what their office like looks like and so i would just go all the time but yeah we made it through all the questions that's all of them yeah um are we still gonna do um intros or do you gotta go brady i can i can uh yeah we can do intros for sure I will stop recording now and we can do that.